So the question about does God reveal himself to other traditions other than the Judeo-Christian tradition comes back to the basic question, what happens to those who have never heard of Christ? The technical theological term for that question is the destiny of the unevangelist. So if people have never heard about Christ, what happens to them? Now, there are a lot of different views on this topic. And so I've given you this chart here. If you look over on the right-hand side, it says theocentric. Theo as in God, God-centric. And on the left-hand side, it's Christocentric. So it's Christ-centered. So there's a difference between the idea of God, which could be a very generic God, it could be any God. And then on the left-hand side, it's specifically Christian, as having to do with Christ. Now let's look on the right-hand side. Theocentric would be an umbrella for pluralism, which is a very, very popular view in this particular era of time. And this is the view that Jesus is not the only savior, that all major religions are equally valid. So it's pluralism. There's a plurality of ways you can be saved. Mm -hmm. And Christianity, Jesus is not the only one. So that is called theocentric. We believe in God. It would be centered on God, but not specifically on Jesus Christ. So that's a category. So now let's move over onto the left-hand side of the page where it's Christocentric or different views when it's believed that Christ is the only way. So I have here three basic different views. Now there's a whole lot more views than just these three, but I have kind of combined them together. And it is a vocabulary that is taken from John Sanders, No Other Name, An Investigation into the Destiny of the Unevangelized. I'm using his rubric of vocabulary here. On the far left-hand side, it's called restrictivism. And that is the idea that a person must hear of the gospel of Christ from a human source before death in order to be saved they have got to have heard the gospel. And it's used as a great motivator for evangelism. Because if you don't go and tell them, they are going to hell. Now, on the opposite side of this is called universalism. And that is the idea that everybody ultimately will be saved. Some of the rationale for that is, if Jesus came to save us from our sins, If he came to conquer Satan and he doesn't save everybody, he failed. So somehow, if you believe that he is all-powerful, he has got to succeed. Now, there's a variety of different ways you can achieve this. One is that everyone is elected to salvation. You might have views of what is popularly known as Calvinism, where you have election where God elects some people to be saved and some people not to be saved. This would be a variation on that basic approach is that everyone is elected to be saved. Now there's another way you could get that is what is called post-mortem evangelism. Post-mortem as in after death. So that after death there would be a way that a person would be able to hear of Christ and make a decision for him, that there is an existence after death that we have an opportunity to continue to learn right. and make decisions. And there's other variations on this, and I'm not going into all of the possibilities, but here are some basic ones. So you have the two extremes under Christocentrism. Both of these, both restrictivism and universalism, require that Christ is the only way. You notice here on the bottom, Underneath, it said all of these views say that all believe Jesus Christ is the only Savior. Salvation is exclusively achieved through Christ. 
Sometimes it's called exclusivism. And all of these claim to be biblically based. All of them have biblical scriptures that they use to support them. So on one extreme, you have restrictivism that if you have not heard from a human source while you're alive, there is no hope. On the opposite extreme is that everyone eventually is going to be saved because Christ will be victorious in the end. In the middle, you have what is called inclusivism. And inclusivism is the idea that the individual appropriates Christ's atonement by faith in God's revelation to the individual. And the person does not have to hear the name of Christ in order to receive this. So this makes the work of Christ, his death and resurrection, ascension, all of the salvific things that Christ did in the act of providing us salvation, whatever that includes. And that's a whole other ballgame we can work on at another time. But the individual person appropriates this salvation that Christ provides by faith in God's revelation to the individual. They are responding in faith to whatever bit of information they have. It might not be very much, but God knows how much they know because God can read other minds when we can't. And God knows how the individual is responding to whatever bit of information or even any corrupted information they might have. They might have information, but it's faulty information. And they might even be reacting against the faultiness of the information because we all know that there's lots of perversions of Christianity and the message might have been given by people who were abusive, et cetera, et cetera. So God knows all of that that's going inside of the individual. And the person does not have to hear the name of Christ in order to receive it. The idea is that Christ did the work and the person appropriates that work that Christ did for them in a response of faith to whatever even tiny mustard seed of information they have. And that is called inclusivism. So people are included. Now, inclusivism would fall very much in line with the early church theology called logos theology. And logos is the Greek word for word. For example, John 1, 1 is in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. The Greek word for word is logos. So in the beginning was the logos. So the Logos is a hugely deep, multi-leveled, multi-faceted term that indicates the creator. He speaks the universe with his word into existence. It's also communication. It's everything that God is as far as God being love and power and creative. All of that is incorporated into the word Logos. It's profoundly multi-leveled. Oh, and part of the idea of the Logos is that he's wisdom. The early church would say, well, some members of the early church, such as Justin Martyr, for example, would say that any place that you find truth, you have found the Logos, because the Logos is the source of all truth. So, for example, Plato and and Aristotle were pre-Christ. So where did they get that wisdom? And a lot of the stuff they said was very similar to the stuff Christ said. And there's a huge amount of studies done on the similarities between Socrates and Christ. But how do you explain that? Socrates was a pagan. He wasn't a Christian. Well, Christ hadn't come yet. He couldn't be. But obviously there's some wisdom there. And so Justin Martyr, for example, would say that Socrates got that information from the Logos. And so whenever you have information that matches, no matter where you get it from, it could be Buddhism. But if it matches what Christ said, it comes from the same source. So that would fall into an inclusivism idea. You might have these pieces of information, even if you don't know the name of Christ, but it comes from the Logos and you are responding in faith to that, you're still responding to the Logos. 
And then there's places in John, for example, if you are of love, you are of God because God is love. So that would fall into that same kind of category. So restrictivism, universalism, inclusivism. These are some views on the destiny of the unevangelized. And it's important to understand that if you want to be Christocentric, you have this great variety of ways to be Christocentric and not theocentric. There's a lot of options for that. And saying that all of these claim to be biblically based, take a very famous verse, for example, that is used by restrictivists. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's a very commonly used verse to support restrictivism. And it is usually interpreted as Jesus is the only way, and if you don't come through him, you can't come, right? Well, think about the context of when that verse was said. Jesus said this before his crucifixion and resurrection, and he is saying this in a Jewish Hebrew context. So he is saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Now, that's a radical statement. It was statements like that why they crucified him, because if it wasn't true, he deserved to be crucified, because that's blasphemy to the max. But he's saying no man comes to the Father but by me. Does that include Abraham? Mm -hmm. Now, did Abraham know the name of Jesus? Did Moses know the name of Jesus? No. No. Now, they knew some prophetic stuff, maybe kind of ethereal, something out there in the future. But as far as the name of Jesus, Mm -hmm. no. But did they respond in faith to whatever bit of information they had? Yes. And so, and Jesus is saying, I have been the source of salvation all along. Before the event of it happening, we can talk about that again, is how can the death and the resurrection of Christ applied to people before the event in a situation of time and space. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so how is it that the event of the death and resurrection of Christ metaphysically applied to people before the event? But that's essentially what Jesus is saying. So would that be an inclusivism interpretation of that verse? Or would that be a restrictivism interpretation of that verse? Both of them can use it. 